It's the Middle Ages in China. The Mongols invaded the country, ousted the Song dynasty and installed their own ruling family. The Yuan ruled with an iron fist. By their law, the Mongols were the uppermost class while the indigenous Han Chinese were the lowest cost of society. But they were but a passing moment and less than a century later, they were swept away from history. And thus, the final chapters of Imperial China began. Hi, my name is Sebastian. This is History in 7 Facts. The era of the Yuan was a far cry from the golden ages of the previous dynasties, but some notable things did emerge, like the Chinese theatre. The earliest Chinese plays, which were sung, spoken, acted and mimed, were written by Chinese scholars during the Mongol rule. It was said that the plays contained protests against the presence of these invaders, and the reaction of the population to these plays contributed to the downfall of the Yuan. And the downfall eventually came. In the 1340s, disastrous floods of the Yellow River and the recruitment of thousands of Han peasants for forced labor sparked a general revolt that ended in 1368 and when the Mongols were overthrown. What came next was China's last indigenous dynasty, the Ming. Soon, Beijing would become the capital, the Forbidden City was born and to protect the empire, a defensive barrier against the outside world was built, the Great Wall. By the way, although the Chinese Great Wall was built during the Ming Dynasty, its foundations were actually laid by Qin Shi Huang in 214 BC, when he united the fortifications of the small kingdoms during the Warring States period to form a barrier to defend the empire against barbarians. Anyway, under the Ming Dynasty, China enjoyed a relative stability and had a complex but efficient bureaucracy, while at the same time it also experienced a period of imperial tyranny. Unlike some Western European countries of that time where the authority of kings was often challenged, the power of the Ming emperors steadily grew without facing obstacles. The first Ming emperor was Hongwu a man with humble origins born into a family of poor peasants who rose to command the rebel forces. Through the Mandate of Heaven doctrine, he claimed the throne and founded the Ming dynasty. The Mandate of Heaven, by the way, is the idea that heaven bestows upon a righteous man the mandate to rule, and if he is unfit, he loses his mandate through revolts or other means. During Hongwu's reign, religious and ethnic tolerance became the norm. Hongwu also reorganized the military and attempted to introduce agrarian and fiscal reforms. In 1380, the emperor abolished the position of prime minister, revised legislation and ensured that his power could not be challenged in court. These actions were supported by a surveillance system consisting of spies, secret agents and the embroidered uniform guard who removed corrupt officials. In 1403, Hongwu's son usurped the throne and ruled under the name Yongle. It was he who moved the capital to Beijing and began constructing a magnificent fortified palace complex, the Forbidden City, the largest palace complex in the world where no one could enter without permission. Beijing became the primary administrative and military center, but other cities also rapidly developed. Suzhou and Nanjing became famous for their sophisticated social life and spectacular festivals. Jing De Zhen produced white and blue porcelain adored by the entire world, while Hangzhou was known for silk production. Many of these cities were connected by the Grand Canal, and business was good. Linjing, for instance, one of the main ports on the canal, handled 1.6 million ship loadings and unloadings annually. As a result of urbanization, a strong urban culture accompanied the development of Ming cities. Education was also expanding. The spread of printing and the demand of a more educated public led to an explosion of publications. Classic novels, such as The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Outlaws of the Marsh, and Journey to the West, or Monkey as it's known in the West, were all printed for the first time, and books with color woodblock prints were published. 
After Yongle's death, the Ming Dynasty faced a new threat from a group of foreigners, the Mongol-speaking Oirats, who, like their ancestors, launched a massive invasion of Chinese territory in 1449. Emperor Zhentong hastily counterattacked, and his armies were lured into an ambush at Tumu, where he was taken hostage. The Oirats, however, failed to capitalize on this opportunity to conquer Beijing, and Zhentong was eventually released. However, the Tumu incident marked the end of the Ming Dynasty's expansionist policies. From that point on, the frontier strategy became much more defensive, lacking the military resources to control the steppe regions from where the Orit incursions originated. A barrier was constructed to contain the Mongol threat. The earthen walls built long ago by the Qin Dynasty were reinforced with brick and stone. The Great Wall of China, as we know it today, was taking shape. Under the Ming, one of the greatest feats of the Chinese civilization was also constructed: the Treasure Fleet. Between 1405 and 1433, Zhang He, a Muslim eunuch and close confidant of the emperor, commanded a vast fleet in seven ambitious maritime expeditions. The first expedition consisted of 317 ships and 27,870 people, and it anchored in several Indian ports. In subsequent voyages, the fleet reached the Strait of Hormuz, the Gulf of Oman, and some ships even reached the port of Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Zhang He's travels took him through 37 countries and resulted not only in the development of Chinese trade, but also in the capture of pirates who had been wreaking havoc in Chinese waters. There's an entire video on the channel about this fleet if you're interested in more details. It was under the Ming that we see the first major European involvement in China. The first Portuguese traders arrived in China in 1514, and in the 1530s they established a commercial outpost in Macau on the southeast coast. Now, interest in Chinese merchandise was always present in Europe, but a special moment was the year 1604. That year, two Portuguese ships carrying some 200,000 pieces of Chinese blue and white porcelain were captured by the Dutch. These items were then sold in Europe, and these auctions sparked a true passion for Chinese porcelain. The beginnings of trade with the West marked a turning point in Chinese history. Over the next 300 years, China's destiny would be closely tied to its commercial relationship with Western powers. Again, there are some videos on the channel that explain the details. By the end of the 16th century, the Ming Dynasty was in decline. Weak emperors were dominated by their advisors who influenced political decisions. Although the Ming Dynasty had the most efficient central administration in the world at one time, by the end of their rule, the harshness of imperial control, court intrigues, and struggles between different factions of officials significantly contributed to the fall of the dynasty. In the north, a new threat emerged from the nomadic Jurchens as Nurhaci organized the tribes and formed the Manchu nation. Economic problems led to peasant uprisings, and in 1644, rebel forces led by Li Zicheng, a peasant that led the rebellion, captured Beijing. Li, in turn, was ousted by the invading Manchus, and a new dynasty took over, the last in a long line of imperial dynasties, the Qing. So who were the Qing? Well, let's give them a short introduction. The Jurchens were the descendants of the founders of the Jin dynasty. In the 16th century, the Jurchens lived near Jilin in northeastern China, where they hunted, cultivated the land, and had trade relations with the Chinese. But in 1616, the Jurchen leader Nurhaci founded the later Jin dynasty and began organizing his people, as well as the Mongols and Chinese who had submitted to the Jurchens. The entire population was enrolled in four military units called banners, each identified by the color of their banner. Nurhaci's successor, Huang Taiji, introduced Chinese-style institutions among the Jurchens. In 1636, he changed the name of his people from Jurchens to Manchus, a word of unknown origin, and in 1637 he changed the name of the late Jin dynasty to Qing, which means clear or pure. The banner system was expanded through Huang Taiji's conquest, eventually encompassing eight Manchu banners, eight Mongol banners, and eight Chinese banners by 1644. 
By the early 17th century, the Ming dynasty faced internal rebellions and was threatened by a Manchu invasion. In April 1644, the rebel leader Li Zicheng, who I mentioned earlier, captured Beijing and the Ming emperor committed suicide. Li tried to persuade Wu Sangui, the most powerful commander at the border, to join him, but instead, Wu negotiated with the Manchus, allowing them to pass through the Great Wall without resistance. The Manchus conquered Beijing in June and Li Zicheng fled. Fu Lin, the six year old son of Huang Taiji, became the Emperor Shunzhi, inaugurating the Qing dynasty that would last until 1911. The Manchus continued their advance southward, crushing any resistance from Ming loyalists. They ordered all Chinese men, as a sign of submission to the Qing, to shave their foreheads and adopt the mandatory long braided queue, which is prevalent throughout the Qing period in China. After gaining control of China, the Qing dynasty established an administration based on elements inherited from the Ming administration, including the examination system for officials. Few Manchus spoke Chinese and even fewer had administrative experience, so each leadership position in the administration was assigned to both a Manchu and a Chinese official, which helped alleviate Chinese resentment of being governed by foreign invaders. The son of Shunzhi, Emperor Kangxi, had the longest reign in Chinese history. Although born a Manchu, Kangxi became an exemplary ruler of Chinese emperors. He read and commented on over 50 reports every day and traveled extensively. He was a patron of the arts and supported education. During his reign, he also faced and suppressed a major internal rebellion and led campaigns against the Dzungas in Mongolia. Emperor Yongzheng, who could have usurped the throne, succeeded Kangxi. He insisted on the use of the Manchu language at the court and increased the salaries of officials to discourage corruption. To ensure the adherence to ideology, he ordered that the sacred edict, which encouraged subjects to worship the emperor, to be read twice a month in Confucian temples. The fourth emperor of the Qing dynasty, Qianlong, expanded the territory of China to its maximum extent. The expansion of the territory led to the development of the economy as well as a significant population growth. According to government estimates, China's population numbered 300 million in 1762. Anyway, Qianlong presented himself as a model Chinese ruler, attending to state affairs in the morning and engaging in painting and poetry writing in the afternoon. Although not exceptionally talented, he was a prolific poet with over 40,000 poems attributed to him. The later years of his reign were overshadowed by the growing power of his favorite, He Shen. An imperial bodyguard, He Shen began building a corrupt network of confidants. Qianlong granted him control over the imperial budget and allowed him to appoint his cronies to high official positions. He Shen is considered the initiator of a tradition of corruption that continued into the 19th century, gradually undermining the status of the Qing dynasty. The first Jesuit Christian mission in Beijing was established in 1598 under the Ming. When the Manchus came to power, they continued the Ming dynasty's practice of using Jesuits for various official tasks. For instance, Kangxi ensured Father Adam Shaw with the responsibility of preparing the imperial calendar. When a mistake was discovered, Shaw was accused of treason and narrowly escaped with his life. Other Jesuit priests were employed as diplomats, architects, artists and mathematicians. In 1692, after Jesuit missionaries had cured the emperor of malaria, Kangxi issued an edict of tolerance, allowing the preaching of Christianity. However, when the Pope forbade all Chinese Christians from performing ancestral worship rituals, the preaching of Christianity in China was prohibited. China had long established overland trade connections with Central Asia and maritime trade with Southeast Asia. From the late Ming period, China also had trade relations with European powers, and by the end of the 18th century, Britain had become China's primary Western trading partner. 
The demand for Chinese porcelain and silk remained high, but tea quickly became China's main export commodity. However, the Chinese only accepted silver in exchange for tea, and the British attempt to create demand for a substitute led to the opium trade. Under the Qing, foreign trade was strictly regulated and from 1760 was restricted to the city of Guangzhou. Complaints about such trade restrictions prompted the British government to send an embassy led by Lord McCartney to China in 1792. This was the beginning of China's quarrels with Europe. Opium, cultivated in India, was now smuggled into China by British firms. By 1821, opium imports reached an average of 4,500 chests per year. Then the price was lowered and by 1830, the quantity had reached 18,956 chests. And then it surged again to over 40,000 chests in 1834, costing 34 million silver dollars, which seriously affected the empire's revenue. In response, the Chinese attempts to limit the opium trade were harsh and they backfired. This business led to the Opium Wars. The wars resulted in China being forced to cede territory to Britain and other European powers and to open its ports to foreign trade. This led to a loss of national sovereignty and a major decline in the Qing dynasty's prestige. As if all of this wasn't enough, the Qing also had to deal with internal revolts. The first and foremost internal conflict was the Taiping Rebellion. This was a major civil war that lasted from 1851 to 1864. The rebellion was led by Hong Xiu Quan, who claimed to be the younger brother of Jesus Christ and attempted to cleanse China from sinners. Yeah, it sounds unbelievable, but it's no joke. The rebellion ended up killing some 20 million people and displacing another 30 million which makes it the bloodiest rebellion in human history. But this wasn't the end of the troubles. The presence of European influence led to yet another revolt, the Boxer Rebellion. This was actually a series of anti-foreigner and anti-Christian uprisings that occurred in 1899. The rebellion was eventually suppressed by a multinational force from Britain, Russia, Japan, France, Germany, Italy, Austria-Hungary, the United States, and with contributions from Spain, Belgium, and the Netherlands. As you can imagine, this further weakened the Qing dynasty. So many troubles led to an economic downfall, corruption, warlords, and criminality. The final nail in the coffin was the Xinhai Revolution. The revolution began on October 10, 1911, with a revolt breaking out in the city of Wuchang in Hubei province, from where it quickly spread to other parts of the country. By the end of the year, the Qing dynasty had collapsed, the empire was abolished, and the Republic of China was born. For the first time in its long, long history, China would no longer be ruled by a monarch. But of course, as we all know, the 20th century brought even more chaos, more violence, and even more bloodshed. That, however, is a story for another time. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.